three, two, one. Welcome to Real Tech for Real People, episode 125. This is Tony Pittman with Mr. Steve Brady. How you doing, Steve? Ah, uh, namaste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want to say Dr. Steve Brady, given all those arguments we've been having about academia. Oh, yeah. Those crazy <laughs> academia nuts. You, normally, guys. I prefer my academia nuts being in cookies, right? <laughs> uh, for those that uh, don't know what we're alluding to, uh, I pity the fool, as Mr. T would say, that hasn't been following Tony, dot, Tony Pittman on Twitter or SCM Professor and so doesn't know about the huge fight over whether students are customers. It's, it's rare when you see Tony start a fight on Twitter. <laughs> And the thing that perplexes me is I can't understand why it's even a fight. I don't, I don't <laughs> understand why it's a bad thing to think that way in some people's minds, but it is. No, it's funny because when, you, when I think back through all the things we've talked about, how many times have we talked about who is Facebook's real customer? And yeah. uh, you know, Facebook is evil. So we always talk about the person who pays, the group who pay are the customers. And we've talked about... You know, we talked about too big to fail, and then you took a shot at was it DirecTV back in the early episodes? Too, too poor to ignore. Yes. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it all comes down to servicing the customer and understanding the customer. And guess what? We have customer related stories in the show today. Sure uh, do. As we focus on tech, like we always do. And I want to jump in real quick and say we are part of the Tech Podcast Network at techpodcasts.com. If you haven't gone and listened to any other tech shows, you need to do it. Tony and I did it the other day, kind of just goofing around here together online, and there's Star Trek tech shows. Uh, there's gaming tech shows over there, so if you're interested in any of those other types of tech shows, not just how to help your family out like we do here with real people and the real tech we talk about, go over to techpodcasts.com with the Tech Podcast Network. We are proud to be part of them. Absolutely. Check it out. Now, Jason Leisure. Hey, we haven't mentioned your name this early in a show, Jason, in a long time. When you get up to episode 125 in another month and a half, you'll hear us mention you. <laughs> he gave us a long email catching us up to date on his family things. It might be some things you remember out of there. The one that caught my eye is he hasn't used Twitter in a very long time, and he says, I don't know why I even used it. Wow. And the uh, funny thing is, my son-in-law told me the same thing, unrelated, just out of the blue. He made the same statement. I haven't used Twitter anymore. I don't see any reason to go back. And yet I just said, you missed Tony's, Tony's battle. Yeah. I'd say my view on Twitter is trending the other way. For a while, you know, I had now it seems that there have been so many uh, interesting exchanges happening there, for me anyway. It's not the greatest platform to really get into a debate of any real substance, but... It is interesting for at least uh, stoking the flames, I guess. <laughs> well, I, in fact, yeah, I was talking to my brother. I invited him to join us on the show today on the Hangout, and he may drop in later. We'll see. Oh, that'd be but, great uh, if he could. Hopefully he can join in. It would be because we have some good Apple stories too. Yeah. Uh, and he's not a fanboy, but he's a fanboy. No, no. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we were talking on the phone today, and he said, you know, it was in the middle of – orientation when this big discussion about students and customer service and education took place because there were like 50 tweets a day. I couldn't keep up with that. I said, hang on. At 124 characters, not words. <laughs> characters, yes. We're talking <laughs> about 5,000 characters. Last yeah. time I checked, that's like two pages. <laughs> Tops. <laughs> you could skim that pretty quickly. So Twitter... You know, it, but he's a celebrity on Twitter, though. I mean, he probably... His stream was probably just going nuts. I'm sure it was. All you know, orientation, students coming, you know. I, I will say, since here's our listeners. Here's the deal, listeners. He is SHC. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's make it clear who's saying this. <laughs> this is Steve Brady, SCM <laughs> professor. That's me. Look at the screen if you're watching us on YouTube. I am saying, listeners, follow SHC Dean, D-E-A-N, and follow Targum Man, T-A-R-G-U-M-A-N. And ask specifically if he will post the songs he did during Late Night with the Dean. 
<laughs> Sounds like a loaded request to me, but I don't know. Well, I just, I, it may be visible, it may, may be available on the web. He does this thing like David Letterman, because as the dean for the orientation for the freshman class, I sat in on the intro to it, his monologue, if you will. He did not one, not two, but three songs. To, uh, when, when you say did these songs, like he's performing these? He sang them on stage. Wow, that's impressive. Including Green Day. That was the third song I recorded. Um, the one that they're playing at graduation. Good Riddance, I think it is. The Green Day song, Good Riddance. He sang that. It was the third song he did. So uh, quite interesting. And I think our listeners need to, A, follow Chris. He could use the followers. And B, ask him to you know put that out there on his website. Yeah, okay. But Jason, you know, we're, we're reading your emails. Just want you to know, any other listeners want to write to us, you can write to Tony at tony.pittman at gmail.com. And Tony will love to, to read and respond to your emails. Oh, I suppose you could write to me too. That's <laughs> 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 the professor at gmail.com. Let's jump into the stories, Tony. Uh, we, are, we are two days away now, less than two days away. We are less than 48 hours away from kickoff for Penn State. True. First off, I have to ask, have you, have you done your episode yet for Penn State football? No. Are you going to be doing them this season? Don't know. Don't know yet. Well, let us know, because I know some of our listeners came over to us from there, and we'd be interested in hearing what you all have to say. Uh, but as we go through this, the technology thing still comes into play. And t- k- t- Kentucky has not one but two schools, it turns out. <laughs> so Kentucky and Louisville? <laughs> yeah, Kentucky and Louisville. They have two universities. Check this out. And both of them are using software to monitor what's being tweeted. So I think we've talked before about this where coaches had banned their, their players. Yeah, some, some just take the easy way and say you're, you're not allowed to. And here we have uh, two other major universities saying we're going to monitor it. I think it's interesting. Yeah, and some of the things they're monitoring, they actually have words that flag and, and cause problems so that they identify you as having used contraband words, if you will, yeah. uh, to include Muslim and Islam and Arab. And they finally wow. said, wait a second, we've got to back those out because that actually is kind of profiling. It is profiling, but this whole thing is interesting. I mean, back in my day, before these social networks. Should we get to Kane and a walker out there, Tony? I'm going to channel my John C. Dvorak here. <laughs> but, you know, there, people would say, oh, they're monitoring these guys. What's wrong with them? But, you know, there always was that type of monitoring. It's just that it was much more easy to control. I mean, before you could do any interviews with, say, a newspaper or a magazine or a magazine, TV, radio, you had to go through the central sports information organization that would okay who was going to do it, how it was going to be used. So you really could get pretty tight control over what student athletes were saying publicly. But now the world is completely different. You know, it's so central to these students' lives, being part of a social network. And if you're a, a known person like these athletes are, I'm starting to question, you know, is it, is it okay to either deny them participation like some schools do or monitor them like this, um, you know, it really, it really gives me a kind of a creepy feeling to think that they'd be subjected to that. And I don't know, it does make me feel good. Well, it, it's one thing to say you couldn't talk to the media. I mean, the parallel to back, to back in your day mm-hmm. would have been, you know, they're monitoring the, the conversation with the media. And, and this is perhaps, but they weren't monitoring your conversations on phone calls or, or letters you would write. Yeah, back in 1994, Tony, did you have emails? <laughs> yeah, we had emails, and no one was monitoring those. But those were not, you know, publicly published, right? Every time you you exchange an email, I think the thing with Facebook, Twitter, this stuff is out there uh, for anyone or almost anyone to see, depending on how you set it up, and it creates a different dynamic. And and frankly, I don't know that the universities really know what to do about it. And so they've resorted to some pretty draconian measures here, in my view. I, I think these kids, you know, I think that I would I would take the approach of really educating them on the context of what they're doing, teaching them the right way to behave, and kind of trusting them as responsible adults to to conduct themselves the right way. But 
Well, you think they should do the yeah. right? Th- try to educate people on how to do the right thing. I think that's what uh, we talked about, you know, fifty episodes ago. That's what I. That's what I would be for. But then you look at the NFL, NBA, you know, where they are really adults, <laughs> and they have policies too, where they're saying you can't tweet. Yeah, so. I don't know. To me, and the Olympics, right? The Olympics yeah, had their policies. To me, if you're an athlete, it, it really is disturbing um, the way they're treating these athletes in in all sports. Like you mentioned, Olympics, college, pro. It seems like athletes are getting a bad rap on this, and it's uh, it's not good in my view. Well, one of the challenges I think at the broader picture, uh, somebody tweeted today. Uh, it's it's the the young lady who uses all lowercase Dana somebody on her Twitter account. Uh, followed by 700,000 people, she tweeted that uh, she's really excited by the fact that high school kids are using Instagram to share their schedules with their friends. And and I look at that, and I and this goes on a conversation I had with my kids tonight with Twitter, where you could go on some of these Twitter apps and look at nearby and see mm-hmm. who's tweeting near you. There's mm-hmm. a couple scary things about this. High school kids are putting on Instagram without a whole lot of protection what they're doing and where they are in classes and what their schedule is. So somebody can come in, pretend to be a related family member, and go, no, 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 they're in this class. I'm, you know, Mom and Dad asked me to come and get them. And, and so if there is a creepy stalker dude out there or dude that, you know, they, could, they could use that. And with Twitter nearby, I mean, I just flip through there just to see what's going on around me. What scares me is that not only does it seem to be predominantly high school girls that are on there, but that if you tap on location, you see where they are when they're tweeting this stuff. And and you know, I don't have that turned on. You probably don't have that turned on. I don't think so. I better yeah. check. <laughs> yeah, but most of us don't. And and so here we have people who probably don't even realize they have it turned on, and they're not only sharing stupid conversations, quite frankly, yeah. but they're sharing them and telling people, here I am. This is what right. I'm doing. And... It, so this whole thing kind of wraps around do, you know, the universities are caring about what are they saying that could harm the university. Sure. You know, I'm kind of concerned about what people are putting out there that could harm themselves. Bring harm on themselves, yeah. yeah. So friends don't let friends turn geolocation on. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my motto today. And Facebook is evil. So, so there's no, that. No, no argument there. Face, yeah, I Facebook. noticed you had you had, you sent Facebook me a note saying is Facebook evil. is evil. What was that? Well, and now there are companies I've noticed who are making entire business models around exploiting the evil that is Facebook. <laughs> you know, like the one I sent you. There's a company holding a seminar on you know how to basically, you know, mine unstructured data for your benefit. You know, leveraging what you can get off of Facebook. I mean, it's become evil on top of evil. Uh, pretty dangerous. You know, we are the product. That's the thing that I keep reminding myself of. In that business model, we are the product being bought, sold, and exploited. Got to be careful. Yeah, so we, we talked briefly before the show about Facebook's value, stock value dropping significantly, and mm-hmm. it ties in with the story we're going to have here in a few minutes. Uh, but one of the things people need to remember with the value dropping in Facebook, Facebook got the money out of the IPO. You know, they got the thirty-eight dollars a share. So the on stock paper, price on paper, and and some of them sold it or at or near those amounts well, and, not, and took I'm, that to the bank, and and others, it's it's on paper still going up and down. Well, I mean, the company, I mean, when because the, the company took however many shares, and the company said we're going to take we're going to sell off this amount of our company at thirty-eight dollars a share. So the bank for the company grew the day they did the IPO. That's what the IPO was all about, right? Building the bank. So they sold all their shares to people who now own part of the company. And so those people that bought those shares are now on paper losing their money. Oh, they are losing their money. But yeah, that value has dropped money. by half. Facebook, on the other hand, has that $38 a share that they put in the bank. They sold those shares on that day. A lot of it. I mean, of course, the, the insiders have that on their paper. It's basically Yes, paper. for them. Yeah, the, you know, what's his face? Who owns it? What's his name? Zuckerberg, um, you know. Yeah, that he's, guy. <laughs> he's, lo- he's lost billions on paper, <laughs> right? right? Because the day it went public, he was worth $38 times X, and now he's worth half that probably or less, right? So, right. yes. But, yes, Facebook, I'm sure, made a lot of money that day, and, and some of the and big shareholders company. were a lot richer then than they are now. Yeah. But um, I, I, I mean, I don't know how Facebook, long term, 
is going to make its numbers. I mean, unless they have something hidden back under the covers there that, uh, that show how they're going to exploit or mo further monetize what they have, it's going to be tough. And it, the, the problem is it's going to really put a lot of pressure on them to be more evil, right? Because it's going to take more evil to figure out how to make more money on, on all the people who signed up for Facebook. I mean, and to be fair, not fair, to be in full disclosure, we have facebook.com slash RTFRP. I mean, yeah. we have a pager, we have a group there. And by the way, hi, people. We appreciate you watching us on there. Yeah. Uh, and, and we appreciate you following the show. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they're not, if you're watching us on Facebook, they're using your information. They're yeah. marketing you and me and Tony to these people selling us as the raw materials to generate revenue. And the yeah. problem for their stock price is people are looking at it saying, you're not exploiting your nearly a billion accounts fast enough. Yeah, and, and I don't know that it even is possible for them. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever clicked on a Facebook ad. Maybe by really? mistake, maybe by mistake once or twice. I don't know, but but it has not it has not been any type of value derived from me, you know, to the advertising on Facebook. Uh, n never. Uh, I can't think of one example of where. Oh my gosh, I'm on Facebook. Oh look at that. Yeah, I wanted to learn more about that or buy that. Doesn't happen for me on Facebook. Um, and how, you know, how about when you accidentally click on a news story that somebody shared and realized, wait, that just got tracked. <laughs> yeah, I could be there. But I, I just think it's highly questionable. You've heard some major companies. Um, it was a GM was a big one at the time of the IPO, came out and said, it's not worth it for us. We're not doing it anymore. You know, Ford has a different opinion. Uh, you know, so it's probably still up for debate, but I don't know. I, I think time will tell. And so far, time has shown that people aren't seeing the value in Facebook that they thought would be there at the time it went public and now that you've got some time to actually look at their earnings. So again, I think they're they're on shaky ground right in there, in my opinion. Now how about you you you've mentioned Google last week or last episode of net neutrality. Mm -hmm. And and we've talked about Facebook and, and the evil things <clears throat> that they do and, and you kind of tarred Google with the net neutrality feather, uh tar and feather thing, hey you know, Google, you're you're not being fair here with the way you handle video streaming, specifically. Now, what's this latest with AT and T and FaceTime? I mean, I don't have Apple products, and so I don't have FaceTime. But what's going on? Is it something to do with 3G? Well, it's really something to do with cellular data of all flavors, 3G, LTE. So, so AT and T came out and said, "Hey, um, with with iOS 6 coming out." Um, FaceTime will be enabled to work over our cellular network, 3G, LTE, all of it. However, we're only going to enable it for those customers who sign up for one of our shared data plans, meaning you buy a lump of data bandwidth from AT&T per month, you can put up to 10 devices on it. So if you've got, if you've got a family and multiple people have you know, smartphones, tablets, not just an Apple deal, right? Any data plan. So you might have a hotspot, you might have iPads, you might have uh, other types of devices. So if you buy one of those shared data plans, which other carriers offer, but for AT&T, in order to have Facebook work on their cellular... Face, FaceTime. I'm sorry, Face... Wow. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if they shut Facebook that, off? That might be foreshadowing. And that's <laughs> the day... That's the danger where this is going. So they've declared that they're only going to allow FaceTime to work. The video, you, the video to video conferencing. Yes. Right? If you buy one of those data plans, people have said, but wait a second. Data is data is data. People like me, for example, who've had an iPhone since the early days, I still have the unlimited iPhone data plan. However, it's now limited in that they won't let FaceTime type data work on that plan and people are really up in arms saying wait a second why are, you know why is it okay for AT&T to let you buy data but then say oh wait 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 you can't use that type of data even though you're paying for it but you can use this type of data if you conform to the way we want to structure our plans and my view is I guess 
they can do it. And some people are saying the FCC should look into it, but but we'll see. But I guess my view is, okay, you can do that, but it should be at your own peril, AT&T, that you would even think about doing that. I mean, I hope people start speaking with their wallets on this one and say, if you want to play that game, great, but I don't want your business anymore. You're not the only one with the iPhone anymore. I'm out of here uh, because it's unfair. I, I, I really do think it's it's unfair. There are a lot of forums where people have done the analysis and based on their usage patterns, you know, how many devices they have in their family, for some people it's a slightly better deal to go to these shared plans. For a lot of other people, me for example, who have iPhones and iPads still on the unlimited plan, mm -hmm. it's not a better deal. And you know, it, it's it's a raw deal actually. So I you know I don't know well, I think it even gets uglier than that because, in a sense, uh, you have an unlimited plan. I still have an unlimited data plan even though I switched over to Android because I got it with the iPhones, and most of us still have unlimited. But then we we flip that over, and they tell us, oh, wait, but if you cross over 3 gigs if you have Edge, or I'm sorry, if you have 3G, or if you cross over 5 gigs if you have an LTE device, we're throttling you back to basically Edge speeds. So unusable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> flat out. And so they tell you that we're going to punish you for using the data that you thought you purchased. And, oh, by the way, we're also going to not allow you to use the things even even if you're below that 5 gig cap or that 3 gig cap. You just you just can't use it. Can't use it. And I think it's I think it's bad, but I think the only way something like that would be changed if is if uh, they start losing a lot of customers. So I'd encourage people who feel this is a wrong move to certainly tell AT and T. And you know, if you're an area, if you're in an area where you have multiple carriers who provide decent coverage, really seriously thinking about uh, switching, right? I mean, that's why companies listen. That's how that's how they listen. So let's talk about your options. You have Sprint. I mean, Verizon's doing the same plans. They're going to have multiple data connection. I mean, multiple shared data device things, right? So you, if you have a phone and a tablet and five phones, mm -hmm. five tablets, whatever, you share a pot of data, unlimited phone, unlimited text, because quite frankly, we're not using phone or text anymore, So, but they're going to bill you for the data. Right. And then, so you've got them, and they may or may not allow FaceTime, but they also don't do what AT&T does, which is have the ability to do voice and data at the same time. So That's a drawback. drawback. That's a drawback, and depending on which device you have, um, if you travel internationally, like I do fairly often, you might run into issues, right, with your device working in as many places as your your GSM device would work uh, on AT&T. So there are drawbacks, but again, if if you have an alternative, nothing gets a company's attention more than walking away with your money. So there's T-Mobile. Encourage you to look at T-Mobile. They they have a lot of. Uh, uh, towers now, I've seen their commercial, they count them. And uh, they're going to tell you they got pretty fast internet connections. And they are GSM, like AT&T, yeah. may not be as portable internationally as AT&T is. Then there's Sprint, they're lack locked into CDMA like Verizon is. So you yeah. have a problem there, but Sprint has unlimited, unlimited, unlimited again. No and throttling, so, no nothing, right? Right, so you get that benefit there. And then there's Ting. Ting.com. If you haven't, or listeners haven't looked at Ting, I'm not going to tell you that they're as great as some other people will tell you on certain podcasts, but I will say Ting is worth a look because you get to pay for what you want to use. You go in and you say, I, I'm going to pay for this much voice, this much data, this many text messages. You look at your history, figure out what it is you really can or will or won't use. Bring your own phone if you happen to come from Sprint. So there's another option there looking at Ting. Uh, so then and there's all those uh, Boost and, and those other ones, but some of those, almost all of those pay-as-you-go phones are tied to AT&T or Verizon. Yeah, they're just piggybacking. Yeah. But I think this is all coming to a head. You know, we talked about the other issues around what Google's doing. Oh, you know, you can watch these videos, but not these videos on that type of device. And and here you have AT&T, so you can buy data, but you can't use this type of data on that plan. I mean... It's it's it really is frustrating to me that that they're making it this complex and it's all I'm sure driven by you know ways they can manipulate 
the marketplace really for data to, to make more money for them. But at some point you cross the line of reasonableness and fairness with consumers in my opinion and doing this doing stuff like this is really you know really not good and I slipped and said Facebook may not work well you know what that's next that type of thing is next then they're gonna start saying well that type of app you can't use unless you have this type of data plan you know you can't fire up Facebook you can't fire up Twitter you can't share a photo I mean where does it end uh, guess what? You know, I can't do I cannot do Google voice on the AT&T network I have to be on Wi-Fi why <laughs> great question Facebook. Facebook now has some video chat. So guess what? You're either gonna you can, you're either you gonna block that. You can't do Google Voice on AT. I can do Google. I can do Google Voice. I can't use Google Talk and go oh, do a voice chat over the data. Okay. And I can't do what we're doing right now. I can't do a video hangout. I have to be on Wi-Fi with that connection. And so yeah, Facebook is probably next if they haven't already blocked it because Facebook is starting to do video chat. Yeah. And so all these companies. So it, hopefully at some point. Apple and Facebook, I mean, if Apple and Facebook and Google, instead of fighting each other over so many of these things, they're going to get together and fight the real other evilness of this whole thing, which is the draconian nature of, of the phone companies. Yeah, yeah, we're kind of on the anti-everybody episode. I think that's Well, the, I mean, these companies are not making decisions in favor of consumers. I mean, let's be honest. They're, they're, they're trying to protect themselves and their own interests. Some people say, well, at and is trying to pr protect its network I don't know if I buy that I mean, because they're encouraging people to <laughs> go to these shared data plans and you know use even more data. They even say the more data you buy, the more you save. So really, <laughs> you're, you're, are you really concerned about protecting your network by by uh, you know moving people in a situation where they'll consume less data? No, you're saying the more you buy, the more you use, the more you save. I mean, so they're trying to get people to use more. They just want them to use it on their terms instead of giving the consumer flexibility to, to you know have have terms that might be better for that consumer so really a challenge yeah I mean, lose sight of the customer and I think this is one of those instances where if, if you feel you have control over the customer the control that the customer uh, feels left out of the process then you're able to do things to the customer that is no longer in the customer's interest and you lose sight of the value of the customer who pays your bills every month Mm -hmm. And in the problem with that is when we do get an opportunity to do something else, we will. You know, we we will switch off of pagers when we find out we can do text messaging. We will switch off of high expensive landlines when we find out that we can do something else. We will get off of AT and T or Ma Bell for our long distance as part of our plan when we get an MCI calling card, and they're going to have to respond in kind. And before you know it. We're going to have unlimited long distance on all of our regular home phone landlines. Oh, wait, we do have that now <laughs> because they were pushed to respond to the competition. It will be interesting yeah. to see where the competition comes here. Speaking sure. of competition, uh, just a quick news story. I posted it up here. Apple was touted as the most valuable company in history just uh, about a week ago. This is if we'd done last week's show, this would have been on there. Uh, the point being here that I found was, and it just just fell in my lap. I'm not even trying to be an Apple hater here. It just fell into my lap that two different stories said one says, unless you look at IBM accounting for inflation, I, IBM was like $400 million back in the 60s after inflation. It's still the most valuable company that ever was in terms of sheer dollars. Microsoft is the other story I've heard that it still exceeds Apple's current value from their value in, I think, the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so, so there's two other companies there, but the, it doesn't deny the fact Apple is on a roll. They're worth $622 billion. And as market cap, that's the, the value of all those pieces of paper, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that's the value that their stockholders have in that company. Of course, mm -hmm. as we all know, if everybody starts to sell that, trying to get all their money out of it, the price will collapse and it'll be worth nothing. Right. So it's really a theoretical deal, but it still says a, a heck of a lot of value is put on them right now. I mean, IBM right now is worth $220 billion. Microsoft's worth about the same. I mean, to see Apple at almost three times the value of those companies is just, I think, insane. I mean, I think Apple's valuable. I think people should have a right to think, you know, there's a bright future for Apple still, but compared to some of these other companies, I don't know that it's that big of a delta <laughs> there, but... Um, 
you know, it's a stock market, always speculative. Um, a lot of irrational exuberance, as they say. And uh, you know, if you've if you if you've had Apple stock since back when they released the iPod or so, you've seen some pretty <laughs> you've seen some pretty pretty big returns. So. Ah, you know, if you were smart enough to buy Apple at sixteen dollars a share when they introduced the iMac, and weren't as stupid as I was to sell it. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be worth a lot of money, yeah. Damn it, I made money. I doubled my money. <laughs> I keep telling myself that was the right decision. <laughs> uh, but you know, on on the other hand of that, they're the most valuable. But then, and and they're they're innovating. You know, I'm an RFID guy. I believe in the value of RFID and electronics, and innovation in the storefronts. Uh, but they arrested one of their customers the other day. He mm -hmm. says he was trying to use Easy Pay self checkout. Mm -hmm. Apparently, you scan it somehow with your phone. You put it in a like barcode yeah. reader or whatever they have, and you just hit checkout. And that he meant to purchase it, but he didn't click the checkout button properly. Okay. You know, you I, I don't know. That? I don't know the case, but I, I based on you know, I've used that service before, and based on just what I read there, I obviously don't know anything personally about this case. I think the guy was probably trying to steal the merchandise. I mean, because I've I've done it before. I mean, it's pretty. <laughs> It's pretty simple, pretty intuitive. I think you know you know when you've paid for it and when you haven't. And at one point, just in conversation with an Apple Store employee, I said, "Yeah, when I use this, you know, I feel like I'm stealing something." And I was just, I was just joking, right? And the guy said, "Oh no, no, you're not. Let me show you." And he pulls up, you know, his handheld device, which is essentially a, a rigged-up iPhone. And he says, "Look, you know, we can see everybody who's logged in, and we can see who scanned something and who's paid. So as you're doing that." There are people in the store who can see, yep, did that person who just scanned, did they actually pay for it? Oop, they're walking out. Hey, So they are watching, basically. I mean, they, it's not like completely the honor system like I think some people may have been led to believe. I mean, they are watching, and I think people should be able to clearly see, yeah, have I completed the purchase or not? And if you're not sure, it's probably in your best interest to go to someone and say, hey, you know, am I okay here? So, you know, someone, I think it was a young kid, teenager, was buying some, and, and, and the, the, the type of product, I think, was a... Headsets. Throw off to me. It wasn't like he was buying the $29 HDMI dongle for the iPad or something. He was buying Bose, you know, headphones, which are probably, you know, on the higher end of the things they let you do that right. uh, self-purchasing thing with. So I think, you know, gee, you go in there, you're, you're a younger customer, yeah, you know, let's be honest. They probably look at those first. Hey, what's this? What's this kid doing here? Okay, he picked up a two hundred ninety nine dollar pair of Bose headphones, and he thought he paid for it. Uh, wait a second. You know what's <laughs> what's going on? So I, I think it's a great addition to the shopping experience. I mean, I've I've used it to buy a cable here, an adapter there. Thought it was great. Didn't have to chase anyone down. Just you know, bought it and left. And um, but clearly, you know, I'm sure when Apple put that in place, they knew they had to do something to make sure it wasn't getting abused. And uh, to me, if someone got arrested, there's got to be more to the story. I mean, has there been a pattern here? Maybe they've been being watched for a while. Um, I don't know. But it, to me, it seems like it's pretty easy to use without getting arrested from my personal experience. Yeah, the you know, for me, having not experienced it at all, and that's going to be the person on the jury if he goes to jury trial. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at it and you go, well, there seems to be a lot of um, reasonable doubt here. He thought he paid. He didn't press the button. He's declined the, a, a deal. I mean, he was told he could do one day, communi one day community service, and they'd let it go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but he said, no, I wasn't trying to steal. I'm going to take it to court. The intriguing thing is, now he's opened up the door to other people because if, if he gets off for this, they're going to have to change the process because people are going to say, no, 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 I, I also forgot. <laughs> and now... Yeah. I think that's going to be a tough sell, though, because I also think if you're in a, in a store or a place of business, you know, and this self-checkout stuff, I mean, it's all over the place, Walmart, supermarkets. I mean, um, it's up to you to, I think, make sure you get a receipt, you complete the transaction. If you try to leave without having reasonable knowledge that you completed the transaction, I, I believe that as the consumer, yeah, you're probably, you know, risking getting yourself into some trouble there. I mean, you should, if you can't tell, if you're not sure, you should go to some, hey, you know, did, 
did this go through? I think that's going to be the argument that retailers will make. Um, and, and my belief is they will probably be successful unless it can be proven that they're misleading these customers, trying to get them arrested, which I, I think would be hard to prove. Now, this will be really interesting in another year or so uh, when JCPenney rolls out their no checkout RFID across the stores. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, think about this. You're going to walk into a store. It's like that video of the, of the IBM commercial from about 10 years ago. The guy walks through the store, shoves stuff in his duster, you know, his nice big jacket there, and he's, everything goes in every pocket at the grocery store. He walks out, and the security guard says, Sir, you forgot your receipt. And he hands him the receipt because you, know, you checked out just by walking through. Mm -hmm. Now, there's going to be another interesting set of circumstances. How do you make sure that the person who just walked out has registered? I mean, do you have to register when you go in? And if you come into the store without a valid RFID, active RFID paying device, they'll identify you, or if something leaves without that, they'll catch you. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big believer in RFID and the benefits of it, but th these are some of the, the security questions you know, for for businesses, and I'll, I'll be here again, this is customer focused. They want to make this experience as easy and frictionless for the customers as possible, but mm -hmm. they do have to insert some level of friction to maintain the pricing that they have. Even Apple you know, would have to raise their prices further if they started losing more to, to shop. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think we'll have to, I mean, there's always going to be some degree of shrinkage, as they call it, in retail. <laughs> yep. And, you know, the thing would be, is this causing that to increase meaningfully or not? There are always going to be people who try to lift things out of stores. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I hope it doesn't just, you know, dismantle this type of approach because I think it's incredibly convenient. You know, we have the technology to, to make use of it. I think for most people it's a great convenience Will there be some people who try to abuse it? Sure, like there always are. But I hope that the, the value outweighs the risk uh, in the eyes of the retailers because it is a great, you know, it's a great flexible alternative. Yeah. Now, of course, Apple has a little more buffer to afford shrinkage now uh, as Samsung is going to have to get out that checkbook. <laughs> Somebody asked me yesterday the other day, how do you write a check for a billion dollars? I wish I could tell you. I, mean, I could do that. I could write one. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> it's not hard, well, said, it's not hard it, to do. <laughs> when it comes time to write the check, I just hope they remember to write pay to the order of Steve Brady at the top. Yeah, I could write, <laughs> yeah. a lot of people could write it. You know, will it go anywhere? That's the problem. <laughs> Sam, Samsung apparently is going to have to do that uh, and write that check to Apple. It's been in the news. Everyone here has heard that. Uh, I saw that Paul Thorat wrote that Samsung was found innocent of copying Apple's design for the iPad, which, I, you know, in me, for me curiously, was the one that everybody talked about that they stole the look and feel. We had that big discussion of holding them up. Do they look the same or do they not? Mm -hmm. and, and that one they were found innocent on. They were. Other... That, was, that was a bit of a surprise because uh, it, that one did look like a pretty direct carbon copy, more so than some of these phones. But I don't know exactly how the claims by Apple were, were articulated or worded on the tablet side, it could, I, I don't know, maybe that's something to do with exactly the type of patent or type of claim Apple thought they had versus what they had on, on some of the phones. I don't know, but that was a curious part of the decision with how they treated the, the tablet. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting how this thing continues because you know, Samsung says they're going to both counter sue and appeal this particular one. So as one person wrote, that check isn't going to be written for a while. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the thing is, I don't think... I think Apple's true when they say we didn't do it for the money. I mean, we just talked about how much Apple's worth, and they've got 80-something billion. They didn't do it to get another billion dollars in, you know, a billion-dollar payout. I think they did it to send a message to the marketplace, to investors, to their competition that says, if you try to take our stuff, you, you know, we will come after you. And I think... Samsung may appeal. There have already been some adjustments on the on the damages based on some mistakes the jury made. And you know, to me, I'm sure at Apple they're saying, "Okay, okay, whatever." We made the statement that says, we, "You know, we believe we can protect our intellectual property in this space." So, uh, so think twice, HTC, and I think it was really a shot at Google, actually. Uh, more than anybody, Samsung just happened to be the 
the <laughs> patsy there that they could hit <laughs> to say, hey, look, don't don't keep doing this. And that's what I think Apple was really trying to get across. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and of course, most of the phones and the devices that they had in the uh, in the suit are older phones. My Galaxy S2 Skyrocket happens to be one of the ones, uh, the S2 itself, mm -hmm. as well as some of the older <clears throat> ones. But the S3, whether it's because it was too new and just couldn't get into the lawsuit or what have you, but that's free and clear. The Galaxy so far, tab. and what I've read is uh, it is it is is new. I mean, you think about when this process started. I don't even know how much Apple knew about the Galaxy S3, but the the thing that I think is important to understand is think about when this really started. You know, this was back in the 2007, 2008 time frame when Apple and AT&T in the U.S. had that exclusive deal. Mm -hmm. All right, so AT&T was selling tons of iPhones. No one else could sell them. And you had carriers like Verizon who were like, oh, my gosh, you know, Samsung, help me. Get me something that, you know, will get customers to come into my stores and look at what I've got. And that's where I think you just saw some of the blatant copying. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I mean, why did they make a photos icon that happened to be a yellow flower, <laughs> you know, for photos? I mean, why? You know, that clearly was, you know. And, and the one that I think is most blatant is the, the way the, the music, you know, the iTunes logo looked at that time. I mean, it's like they changed the hue a little bit, but it was exact. I mean, so to me, they were really trying to make it look like, hey, I got a cool phone too. And it looked, you know, so similar. I think a jury would have had a hard time saying, oh, that was just a chance, you know, match. I mean, those were things that there was no technical reason or no engineering reason that another company could claim drove them to do that. I and mean, they were clearly trying to, you know, I think put out a product that would compel customers to give it a second look at the same time the iPhone was sitting only with AT&T. And my view, and I don't know what happened in the Apple boardrooms, but I would bet that a reason they focused on that time, those phones, is because that was a much more compelling time and case for them to show the motivation and the need and everything else that would have been there for Samsung to partner with these other carriers to do what they did. Now, with the device being pretty much with all carrier, I mean, the things have changed a lot that I think it waters down Apple's case a little bit. So I think they went with what they thought was closer to the sure thing for this first trial, which is smart legal maneuvering, right? Go for something that you really think you can win, you can set a precedent, and then see if you can go after the other stuff. I think that's what they're what they're doing. And the interesting thing is the fact that also it's playing out in international courts. <clears throat> And I think we talked about a month ago now about the British judge who told Apple to apologize to Samsung. Yeah, they'd take yeah. an ad apologizing that they thought Samsung copied them and basically said, hey, Samsung's not as cool as you guys. And this Haven't product. seen that ad yet. but Yeah, well, it's because we don't, <laughs> we don't live in the UK, right? But I don't we, think we, they're going <laughs> to... I don't think they're going to do that. But another argument which I think is valid is um, I've heard multiple people say, well, Samsung probably did this, knowing that this might happen. But so it might cost them a billion dollars. But I think they made about twenty times that <laughs> by getting a foothold in the market. You know, doing much better than the Rims and the, you know, Microsoft did with their phones. I mean, one could argue that it was still a good business decision for Samsung. And and of course, and it probably you know, was even with this loss in the courts. Let's don't let's don't forget that Motorola uh, has been part of this as well, and there's lawsuits mm -hmm. out there for Motorola because they really the first ones with the Droid when they partnered mm -hmm. with Verizon, mm -hmm. uh, they were the first Droid phones uh, with the Motorola ones. They coming were the out. first Droid phones, but I think it would have been a little harder argument against them because if you look at those interfaces, it, there's some things aren't as blatant. And again, I think Apple went with the sitting the, what they saw as the sitting duck to mm -hmm. send a message to those who might have been a little bit more hard to skewer, but it was enough to say, hey, don't don't think you're safe. Or maybe you should consider making a deal with us. And I really think that's what Apple was trying to do because there are a lot of other players they, they could also go after and could have gone after now, but I think they chose the, the easy win, so to speak, to kind of make a statement. What surprised me was when I heard that in, in some of the emails and the, the discovery that came out, Samsung actually did say, hey, make it more like the Apple. 
Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, that's that's a smoking gun that you just can't hide. Right. Uh, we're we're learning all about the importance of email trails and what happens when you can and can't. But see uh, good good business. I I still think it's a good business decision. I mean, yeah, it's, it's I, mean, I, I think it was successful. I mean, we, uh, we, I work for HP, as many of our listeners probably know. We uh, bought Palm, right? Who, before we bought him, had tried to go, dare I call it, the honest route, you know, <laughs> cre- cre- creating something that was also innovative in its own right with the Palm Pre, but didn't create the same look and feel and flair exactly as Apple had. It didn't work. It didn't work. You know, it wasn't successful. So now you could say, all right, who made the better business decision? Yeah, Palm was never going to get sued for copying Apple, but Samsung had devices that got traction that things like the Palm Pre didn't because they weren't as Apple-esque, in my opinion. And so, yeah, did they pay a little bit of a penalty here? Sure, but they're still in the business, whereas Palm's not, right? So, you know, it's... a uh, you know, it's not exactly just a flat-out loss for Samsung. I think, in some ways, they're probably saying, "Eh, okay, <laughs> you know, let's keep let's keep moving on here." And this is an interesting game too, because it's kind of like a shell game. Because Samsung not only made a lot of money on their phones, they made a lot of money with the Retina display in the iPhones and in the iPads. Now, Apple's yeah. moving away from Samsung manufacturing those, but you know, you think about it, Samsung was getting money on both sides of this case. Yeah. yeah, they they made money on every iPhone that was sold and every and, and every Android that they sold that, of their own product. So it's it's very interesting the way that whole thing plays out. I encourage our listeners if they haven't been paying attention to this, just go read it just for some you know, grins, as they say, and and see what comes up. I want to switch gears real quick uh, to something I'm going to recommend. I've recommended this to Matthew. For those that don't know, uh, my son he's been on here a couple times with us. Spread HD GFX on Twitter. He's a photographer. Matthew Brady is a great photography name, and We've been talking about how to do online storage. He's got a new camera, 24 megapixels. Yeah, he's got a 64 giga. He shoots in raw mode, so I think we've talked about that before. It stores every pixel. It doesn't compress anything. And it stores it exactly where the chip saw it. And so you get very, very large files. And he's got a 64 meg- a gigabit memory card in his camera. He's going to shoot probably two of them per football game. Think about that. That's 128 gigabytes of storage from a football game because he'll be on the sidelines for the games. And he needs a place to store this data that because it's going to exceed his 500 gigabyte hard drive in what, one game? So we're trying to find places to do this. Amazon's coming out with a thing called Amazon Glacier. Uh, now, Tony, I don't know if you... Do you use any of the Amazon S3 products? Um, no, no, not not directly, although I think if you use Dropbox, you're using Amazon S3. I think you may be right. right. They, <laughs> they, they contract through that. Yeah. Uh, so the way this works, Amazon has a lot of storage out there, and they've been selling it. And uh, so S3 is one of their ways of doing it, and they charge for the in and for the out. So they, they charge for traffic as well as storage. They've come up with this called Am- Amazon Glacier. It's for those things that are very infrequently accessed. Uh, so... If you're taking a lot of pictures, you're going to want to keep all of them, but you're going to not want to... You, you may be going to pull the 20 or 30 best ones for your website or for the uh, the production work you're doing, and you're going to want to store all the rest of it someplace else. So Amazon Glacier is extremely low-cost storage. It's going to be both secure and durable. In other words, it's going to be up there. They're going to be redundant storage, so if one of their systems goes down, it'll be on another system. But they are selling it now for storage for one penny per gigabyte per month. So you good. figure, yeah, you've got 10 gigabytes, that's 10 cents. You've got 100 gigabytes, that's a dollar. You've got a terabyte, that's $10, right? So That's, a, that's pretty good, and it, you know, but they throttle the speed. Um, I mean, if he's talking about photos, I just wonder, did he look at, like, Flickr Pro? He has a Flickr Pro account, but they don't and let you upload raw files. Oh, he wants to get the raw, okay. Because he's going to want to save all his raw images, right? Because you want to be able to manipulate and have the actual digital image. Or digital okay, media. yeah, yeah. So you can upload the full resolution JPEGs, I think, but yes. Right. Uh, they, they limit the file formats. Okay, so yeah, he needs something where he can basically just store whatever bits he wants to store, I guess. Huh? Yeah, and, and the convenient thing at Penn State up until this semester, they they throttled their, they capped, I should say, they capped the bandwidth consumption at 10 gigabytes a week 
and they just they just lifted that cap in the in the residence halls. So he's now and and I don't know if that was a combination of up and down because obviously he'd be uploading pictures. Yeah. And and I know it's the downsides because you know, the kids were all upset because they couldn't watch their favorite Futurama or whatever. Yeah, that would be painful. Online. So when did that go into place? I wonder. Yeah, they've they've had it for ever since Matthew was there, so at least the past two years. I think Heather had it while she was there as well. Now they just lifted it. You said they just lifted it, but they said, you know what? what? We have reserved the right to screw you over if we need to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's in my AT and T contract, also. So <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> so yeah, it's not it's not just limited to them. But uh, Amazon Glacier, if you're interested, uh, check it out. It's spelled just like the ice glacier, uh, and. Uh, I think it's aptly well, well, named <laughs> because it moves Glacier. slowly, and that's that's the thing. It it will name. move slowly. It's for those that moving large amounts of data over hours, not minutes. Although it's a bit of an oxymoron because I don't think there are any glaciers anywhere near the Amazon. I don't think. Ooh. Uh, but I get the point. That's tricky. <laughs> Pretty sneaky. Yeah. Not sis. <laughs> what was that game? Was that the? Uh, Othello? Where the, it's where you drop the red and black. Connect suckers. four. Connect four. Is that what it was? Four. And Connect she comes four. up with. Yeah. Pretty sneaky, says. You mentioned Dropbox. I have one more a little tip. For Dropbox, they've added two step verification. Uh, I do say hat tip to Lifehacker. I saw this over there. Uh, what it, my, my take on it is it doesn't make things that much more secure, in my opinion, because if you once you've logged in on your computer, if you leave your computer open, Right. Your Dropbox is still not secure. Uh, people can still perhaps get in through that. But now, if you try to log on to the website from elsewhere, like you, you log on to a, a, a browser in somebody's office or somebody's house because you want to get to a file you need to work on, or if you're one of those people that uses the business centers and hotels, which if you ask me is a lot like drinking out of the bathroom t public <laughs> toilet. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, there, okay, there you go. The public toilet. We've got a show title. Uh, it also will show you the weather where they are, and if it can, it'll give you caller ID information about who's calling in, although it gives me some really bizarre things. So, for instance, a, a guy called me the other day with his cell phone or his home phone. Apparently, they still have the old owner of the phone number in there because Valerie Hill was not this guy. <laughs> Kind of interesting, but uh, current caller ID is kind of cool. If it, the, the biggest drawback is with cell phones these days, we still have cell phone numbers in Dayton, Ohio, and so yeah, you know, they call me with a nine three seven area code, and, and I'm like, hey Stephanie, the weather in Dayton, Ohio is you know ninety five degrees. And it's so raining. it just goes by the number, it doesn't go by where the phone is. Yeah, well, Unle unless you happen to have more information loaded in there, and it can figure it out. So. Yeah. It's where the ID card is. Anyway, it's current caller ID. It's available for the Android, and I don't want to say much more about it. It's just kind of fun to do as long as you don't have it doing other things. Yours sounds far more interesting. Well, it's, it's not too different, actually. It's called Dark Sky, and um, you know, for those of you who always want to know if you're about to get rained on, <laughs> it's, oh. a, <laughs> it's a pretty interesting app. You can fire it up. The only downside is in order for it to do what it does, it's always using your location service, so it uses your GPS, but you can tell it to let you know um, if it's going to rain near where you are. And so, you know, a lot of times if you're doing events, cookouts, whatever, where you're going to be outside and you're not sure, you don't have to sit there and say, oh, let me go back to the weather app. Let me go. It will just tell you, hey, light rain starting 10 miles away, you know, get ready. And to me, you know, that's pretty cool. It has, also has the other stuff that weather apps have, like you can look at the radar, you can see your, but the, to me the unique feature of this app is that it will monitor locations you tell it and then tell you when rain is approaching, notify you on your device. I think right now it's only for iOS, but um, I thought that was a pretty neat feature to, to build into an app. Tell me when it's going to rain, don't make me have to go check. Yeah, don't make me go to the window and look outside and then say, is it raining? <laughs> yes, I am talking about you, Zoe. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great app, and I've got one similar to it. I'll try to remember to talk about next episode uh, for National Weather Service warnings uh, for those of us that seem to live in new tornado alleys. But uh, you know, I, you know, we've done the picks. 
we can either say goodbye and then do a quick after show on Windows 8, or we can talk about it real quick. Let's talk Windows 8. Okay. One of the things I found, because I did the release preview, is if you have installed Windows 8 and you want to upgrade to the new version of Windows 8, the final version, the RTM, then you will lose everything. You, but if you move from Windows 7 to Windows 8, it will keep all your apps. It will keep all the installation issues. So if you have Office and you have Adobe Suites and you've got... Uh, all right, what all would you have on your Windows machine? You know, your email program, if you're using Thunderbird or Firefox or whatever, your Chrome, all those things and all the settings... It'll lose all of that if you go from Windows 8 to Windows 8. But if you move from Windows 7 to Windows 8, they've done a beautiful job of keeping it. Well, it turns out, if you go into the settings on your installation disk and you change one file, and you just change the number from 80-something 25 down to 7100, when it goes and does the check on the version of Windows that you're running, it will actually go and say, oh, we can go ahead and just do a complete upgrade with keeping all your apps in there. So I was able to do that. My notebook computer is running great on Windows 8, the final edition. And, and I will tell you, I, I was a little curious about the fact they were getting rid of the arrow designs, you know, the, the, the glass look on the, on the windows. Can't tell the difference. Can't tell. Can't tell. It, it's, it's just as good. So a little faster. Uh, I do like Windows 8. I like the start button. I'm getting more and more used to the, the, the interface formerly known as Metro. Uh, for the things I put on that main screen, it's really kind of clean. Uh, it works out, works out nicely. And, and I can just click on something really right there and say, okay, I want to get the headline news real quick. I want to check the weather real quick. I want to uh, see photographs that friends of mine have uploaded in Flickr or something. I can do that right from that screen. So it's convenient. I still spend most of my time on the desktop. Nice, nice. Well, I can't wait to see uh, how well Windows 8 does. It's such a big change, but... I admire Microsoft for recognizing that they probably need to make a bold change right now. We'll see how see how it's accepted. Yeah, yeah, and something I think they had to do. So, we'll, yeah, like you say, we'll see see where it goes. So, what's this other thing you've thrown in here? Well, um, you know, one of the things I think you're going to see now with Windows 8 being fully touch enabled is, you know, one of Steve Jobs' axioms is going to be challenged here. I think he was famous at one point for saying no one would ever want to use a touch screen in a regular, you know, laptop form factor, you know, reaching out. And I don't know, I think Windows 8 is going to challenge that. Windows 8 along with some of the designs from the hardware manufacturer. I just put a link in the notes where, you know, HP just announced this NVX2 Spectre uh, machine that has it basically can work just like a normal laptop, but it has a touch screen. And uh, in one of the models, you can actually detach the screen, and it kind of all of a sudden turns into just like a tablet device. There are batteries in both parts, right? So batteries in the screen, batteries in the keyboard part. So it kind of the attempt is to give somebody the best of both worlds, right? That tablet this is nice, yeah. versus a full laptop. And I don't know. We'll see. Uh, it's, it's pretty innovative. Yeah, I do like this idea that it's a it's an ultra book and it, it looks like it's nice and thin. Mm -hmm. Do you know how thin it's going to be? I'm looking. Oh, uh, I haven't seen them publish the actual measurement yet. Yeah, essentially, or, or it, is there pricing either? But, uh, the, the ABC story here oh, acknowledges yeah, yeah, it's very pricing. similar in in a sense to the ASUS Transformer, mm -hmm. where you you have it in a keyboard. You know, Matthew has the ASUS Transformer. It goes into a keyboard. And it clamshells shut like a notebook, and it has a touch interface. Here it and is, like 17 seventeen point nine millimeters thick, or as Apple would say, seventeen point nine millimeters thin. Thin, right? <laughs> it has HDMI out. It has Ethernet, USB yeah. three, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt. And Thunderbolt is a surprise to me. But how about NFC? Yeah, NFC. So you can tap your devices against it, and it's only fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, that puts it right outside the price range of the Asus Transformer <laughs> or the Transformer Prime or the Optimus Prime or any of the other <laughs> Transformer it, it, names. Yeah. Well, but I think, is, again, I think Windows 8 is going to make devices like this probably show up more. I don't know. Um, I, I, you know. I sometimes reach for my iMac screen like I'm sitting here doing, but I don't seem to ever reach for... 
my laptop screen. And maybe it's just because the way the form factor is set up. So I don't know if people will like this or not, but we'll see, I guess. We'll see. I do know Matthew with the Transformer, he, he very quickly got involved with the type touch, type touch, type touch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even though he had a mouse pad built into the, the keyboard and there was way there were ways to to work it that way traditionally he very much started swiping and scrolling and moving his hands U using and, it running what Android it running Android yeah okay so so that at least for a 20 year old <laughs> it's, it's, it's not out of the question it's not out of the question it was, it was adaptable for him and and what I like about what you've just shown is let's say I don't want to use it where I touch the screen when it's in notebook mode. You're I still like the idea that I can rip it off and it becomes a tablet and I can operate in the tablet interface and off, off to the races. Bob's your uncle. Yep. yep. So. Well, those are great little add-ons we had there at the very end, but uh, it is a little over the hour, so why don't we just uh, remind everybody that everything we've talked about was tech and that that tech was real. <laughs> <laughs>